Okay, so I guess we'll um, get this going. Uh, welcome, first of all, everybody, to uh, the 2011 uh, arguments class for the summer. Um, we're now entering the second half of the class. This is an experiment, as uh, all of your instructors explained. Last year, we did the uh, seminars on one week and the uh, lectures on another. This week, we've brought those two halves together, doubled the intensity, as it were, uh, putting seminars and lectures together, which is, in fact, um, the ambition of the course, to make the lecture series into something that is integrated with a seminar-type environment. Um, of course, the ambition is to address cultural production in architecture that takes place in forums like journals, in publishing, in criticism, in exhibitions. Uh, and it's not only about those spaces, let's say. This class is one of those spaces. And it's you guys that are really uh, driving it. So without too much uh, ado, um, I'll introduce our speaker today. We are, I'd say, exceptionally uh, uh, grateful and lucky to have uh, Tom Weaver, editor of AA Files, with us today. Certainly one of the uh, most interesting uh, editors working today in the field. Uh, if you've all had a chance to take a look at the um, AA Files magazines at Avery, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at those, uh, I'm sure you will be down there, uh, if not right after class, then uh, early tomorrow. Um, Tom Weaver uh, is not only the editor of AA Files, uh, he's also the managing editor of all AA's books and publications. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Craig Buckley, and I am in many ways uh, doing a similar job to Tom here at Columbia. I direct the publications for the school in addition to teaching. So given how many and how good the publications at the AA are, I can only uh, imagine how difficult your job must be and be jealous at how good you are at that job. So uh, all of which is to say, again, uh, that it's exciting to have you here today. In addition to editing AA files and managing all of the myriad uh, books and magazines and bits of interesting paper that come out of the AA, uh, Tom is also a tutor in the MA Histories and Critical Thinking program at the AA, and he's a PhD supervisor there. Um, before uh, landing at the AA, or before the AA was lucky enough to get him, uh, Tom was an editor at Any Magazine, which many of you, of course, will know from the 90s here in New York. Uh, he was, uh, had the privilege of being Norman Foster's ghostwriter, uh, and he taught architectural history and design uh, at places such as Princeton University, Cooper Union, and the Bartlett School of Architecture. He also studied the Bartlett, getting his BA in architecture and his MA in modern architectural history, and uh, was almost a colleague of ours at uh, Princeton. Uh, we didn't overlap, but uh, he did his PhD at uh, Princeton in the School of uh, Architectural History. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Tom Weaver. Craig, can you hear me okay? Um, thanks, Craig, for that introduction, and thanks so much, Enrique, for the invitation. How's that? Yeah. It's actually a real pleasure to be back here in Colombia, and it's also a pleasure to be out of the AA right now. The AA term is just about to end, and um, the students, the whole school is kind of enveloped in a kind of fog of plywood, sawdust, resin, that nasty powdery stuff that rapid prototyping models are made out of and other carcinogens. So it's quite healthy to be out of the AA right now. Um, so what I'm going to do today is basically, I'm just going to give a sort of informal presentation about the kind of work that I do at the AA, partly through, well, largely through AA files. And then I think that we're going to have a kind of question and answer session. And hopefully you can just feel free to ask me any question from the audience. Um, so the, I'm basically going to talk about the sort of the written word and more generally kind of the importance of language and writing. Um, and I'm going to do that mostly through a kind of series of presentations on the idea of the editor and more specifically on my work at the AA uh, and, and the journal that I edit, AA Files. And for me, AA Files and the AA school itself are inseparable. As I'll go into later, just as directors of the AA, as with many other schools of architecture today, have often imagined that their school is like a kind of magazine which they edit. 
I want to invert this by presenting my magazine as if it is a model for a kind of school, containing within it ideas for the writerly and visual presentation of architecture. So I'm just going to begin with this reference and an image of an editor. This is the French author, statesman, and editor André Malraux laying out page spreads for his 1947 book, Le Musée Imaginaire, across the floor of his Parisian apartment. It is an image that very obviously radiates a certain architecture, not only in terms of the elegance of its high ceiling Parisian apartment with its parquet floor and grand piano, but also the architecture of the diagram of editing it displays of a certain genteel assurance and of a man calmly and confidently enveloped by his own creation. More fundamentally, it is also an image of the editor as accumulator. It is also very clearly staged. If you look very closely, the, the pages themselves are facing not Malraux, but the camera. So he's clearly set, set the shot up. The image has been widely, widely used by a number of different authors, often to illustrate different things, but in the terms in which I am using it, the photograph is also drawing on a longer art historical tradition of the collector. This is the great painting by uh, David Tenier called Archduke Leopold Wilhelm in his picture gallery in Brussels from 1651, and it's in the, um, it's in the Prado in Madrid. So in, in essence, this painting offers the same diagram of the gathering together of material, of the idea of sequence and accumulation, and the juxtaposition of, the thi of one thing next to another, and of the incentive to make a selection and of choosing one thing over another. All of these things are fundamentally editorial concerns. Implicit to both images of Mauro and of Archduke Wilhelm is a sense of the editor as connoisseur. Here's another image. This is Bernard Berenson in the Villa Borghese, uh, from in Rome in 1955, it's a famous photograph by David Seymour. And so this image of the classic connoisseur, um, the art historian Bernard Berenson, with his sort of gabardine suit and his Panama hat, is also in effect an editorial diagram of someone both acquiring knowledge and reveling in their own prior knowledge. In this sense, there seems to be something paradoxical about editing. The conventional view of the editor is one that envisages the editorial mandate as one of shortening of cutting, of removal and abbreviation. But as these images show, within the figure of the editor and the role of editing, there is simultaneously an opposing process, process of assemblage, of generating material, of collecting writers and images, of acquisition. Editing then does two opposite things at exactly the same time. Other than these cultural touchstones, which I admit stretch the bounds of who we typically understand as an editor, the image of the editor is strangely absent, even though Today, everyone seems to be an editor, or certainly at the AA, where the assignation editor is used much more than architect. It is actually quite difficult to identify any editors. Even beyond architecture, there are not really many readily identifiable editors at all. One of the few is this woman, Anna Winter, or Anna Nuclear Winter, as she is known to her junior colleagues at Vogue. The first person who pops up in Google Images when you type in editor. With her signature sunglasses and immaculate, crisp bob, uh, Winter has become the defining silhouette or emblem of the editor. Winter's great innovation at Vogue was the fairly mindless but remarkably successful device of putting photographs of celebrities on the cover of her magazine. Interestingly, this tactic itself has carried itself over into architecture, in particular the Spanish magazine El Croquis, which from the mid-90s onwards absorbed this cult of celebrity and transposed it onto architecture. And so we get these close-up images, warts and all, especially in Zaha's case, of a new generation of architectural stars. Although this editorial and graphic conceit has also been easily parodied. This is the aspiring architect and sometime actor on his own fake El Croquis cover. The only other editors one could draw upon would be literary editors like this man, Maxwell Perkins, the editor of all writers talk about who worked with Scott, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, and Thomas Wolfe. Or the filmic editor. Here is the terrific French um, filmmaker Francois Truffaut, um, shown alongside his hero Hitchcock, who before he made any of his films worked as a critic and as an editor on the journal Cahiers du Cinéma. And through this role broke the established mold that editors never somehow overlap with artists. Or some of the great newspaper um, editors 
Here we have the great editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, or rather in the absence of the real Ben Bradley, this is Jason Robards playing Ben Bradley in the Hollywood expose of Watergate, All the President's Men. Robards presented Bradley in what has become the definitive image of the print journalist, sleeves rolled up, permanently sitting behind his desk, foul-mouthed but kind of paternalistic. This is a kind of more loose or kind of rakish de uh, depiction of the magazine editor. This is, this is uh, Hugh Hefner, photographed editing Playboy in 1961, a kind of image that speaks for itself. For many editors, though, the definitive editor as hero is this man, Gordon Lish, who was the literary editor at Outward Knot in the 60s and 70s. And in this role, he edited a great deal of contemporary American fiction, including Richard Ford, Don DeLillo. In particular, though, he edited all of the writings of this man, Raymond Carver. Lish is famous for the extent of his editing. He was no copy editor, simply correcting the spelling and grammar of his writers, but an editor who radically transformed the text in front of him. Here, for example, is, a, um, is, is Lish's edit of Carver's short story, Beginners, which Lish retitles what we talk about when we talk about love. You can see the extent of his edit. He changes the names of the characters and trims down the text into what readers came to appreciate as Carver's characteristically spare and minimal prose. Lish became famous because after Raymond Carver's death, his widow published Carver's own preferred manuscript, with its original title, Beginners. And when, when you read it, you can immediately see that Lish's version is much better. Because of this, the story of Lish and Carver has become a kind of morality tale, endlessly preached by other editors to warn of the dangers of the unedited and celebrate those things only an editor can provide. In architectural editing, however, there's no such heroes. And this is in spite of the fairly remarkable fact that three of the greatest architects of the 20th century were also magazine editors. So we have Le Corbusier's wonderful uh, L'Esprit Nouveau, G Magazine, which was edited by Mies, the first issue, and uh, De Stiel, which was edited by Van Dersburg. So seeing this cast of luminaries as an architectural editor, one could easily get quite delusional about the magnificence of the practical, real architectural career that will follow your editorial one. Other more part-time Editors I could think of would include Nicholas Pevsner, who edited the Architectural Review during the early 1940s, while the regular editor, J.M. Richards, was on active war duty. And Rainer Bannum, who succeeded Pevsner, who was his PhD supervisor, in working as an editorial consultant on the AR in the 1950s. In English architectural publishing, the only really true and dedicated editor was this woman, Monica Pigeon, or The Pigeon, as Peter Eisenman used to call her, who was the formidable editor of architectural design from 1945 to 75. Monica Pigeon was absolutely no part-timer or a designer earning some money before her career in practice took off, but a dedicated professional editor. These are some of the covers of, of AD in the period of her edit editorship. It was the kind of great magazine to read in the, in the sort of 50s and 60s in particular. And it was through Monica Pigeon and AD that you really saw the emergence of a kind of English pop architectural um, scene uh, of sort of Cedric Price and the Independent Group and uh, later in Archigram. Pigeon was also very, very good at spotting talent. Almost more than the issues she published, the real thing she was editing was the staff around her. She had, as for example, her art director was Theo Crosby, who did all these designs, who went on to found the design company Pentagram. And she um, hired as technical editors or her sort of assistant editors, uh, Ken Frampton, Robin Middleton, and Peter Murray. Here's a very, very young Ken Frampton on the left, <laughs> with Monica Pigeon in the middle and Peter Murray on the right. Okay, to this cast of editors, one can in many ways add the figure who established the reputation of the AA. This is Alvin Boyarsky, who directed the school from 1971 through to his death in 1990. Here is Boyarsky flanked by busts of Christopher Wren on the left and Inigo Jones on the right at the AA in the 1980s, sitting in his office like an editor 
with three telephones in front of him and an in-tray and an out-tray and a desk scattered with papers. The three directors of the AA who have succeeded Boyarsky have never quite pulled off the same editorial swagger. Here, for example, is the man who is immediate successor. This is Alan Balfour, who uh, ran the AA from 1990 to 1995. So um, Wren and Jones have disappeared, and in their place we get a student drawing but a kind of just a scattering of papers. And then uh, Balfour was succeeded by Moisa Mustafari, now the dean at the GSD. And Jones, Inigo Jones is back, but sort of Jones is looking at Moisen and Moisen's looking at Inigo Jones, as if they're not entirely trustful of each other. <laughs> and then the current director of the AA, who replaced Moisen, is Brett Steele, who took over in 2005. So again, uh, Christopher Wren and Inigo Jones have disappeared altogether. In their place, we have a wall of books. So much more than the editor, the, the head of the school in this instance is the bookseller. Let's go back to Boyarsky, though. Here's another one of Welsk from the same time, looking a little sterner. As, as the great recent research by Irene Sunwood from Princeton has shown, it was as an editor, as much as a pedagogue, that Boyarsky radically expanded the remit of the AA school and particularly through his, its publications program. There had always been journals and books produced by the AA ever since the school was first set up in 1847. And in the school's actual founding charter in the mid-19th century, it says that the it stipulates that the school has to produce magazines. So this is actually the very first um, school magazine, AA Notes. So this is the frontispiece from 1887, I think with the school's kind of motto, design with beauty, build in truth. And it was just basically a kind of um, a house journal, so just you know, telling the membership of the wider membership of the AA what was going on inside the school. So AA notes ran from the mid 19th century all the way through to the 50s, when it was replaced by this magazine, Arena. And again, suddenly it becomes much more pop, sort of constructivist images and sort of more filmic sort of early, early archigram stuff. I mean, Peter Cook was obviously teaching at the AA at that stage. And then Arena itself was replaced by AAQ, Architectural Association Quarterly, which was edited by Dennis Sharp. So again, as Irene has shown, Boyarsky even turned other aspects of the school into editorial projects. And so the simple piece of paper that was pinned up each week telling students what lectures and classes were on became a publication in itself, the events list. So here is the classic sort of just regular A4 sheet of paper just saying what's, what's on and where. And Boyarsky turned it into this, the famous events list, designed and clearly edited as a sort of one-sheet document that was handed out to all the students and staff. He also endorsed sort of more kind of satirical student publications. This is the Ghost Dance Times, which was edited by Martin Pawley, who was then a student at the AA. Although ultimately, uh, they cut a little too close to the, the bone with um, Boyarsky, and he, he cancelled the, the Ghost Dance Times some years after this. So then after following the kind of removal of Pawley and of Dennis Sharp, Boyarsky launched his new magazine, AA Files, and he did this in 1981. The very first issue actually has two covers. Originally, he commissioned a cover by Nigel Coates on the left, um, but he didn't like the result, so then they republished, rewrapped the same contents with a design by Ron Heron from Archigram on the right in that kind of default architect standard silver sans serif. So AA Files itself has been going since 1981, Soon after those first issues, it sort of developed its sort of graphic standard that was set by a man named Dennis Bailey. And you know, in these early sort of 80s issues, you saw the emergence of people like um, Zaha. And on the right, there's early Yokohama ferry terminal stuff. And this is pretty much all of the issues. The last one actually didn't quite fit in my even grid, so it's not included. But there's one more, number 62. So A Files itself was launched in the autumn of 1981 as the successor to this long line of AA house journals. As I wrote in my 2020 essay, over the next 30 years and 62 issues, 
just as successive directors of the AA have had to manage the weight of expectation in succeeding the charismatic Boyarsky. So too have AA Files editors had to deal with school directors who, like Boyarsky, fancy themselves as editors. There have been three directors of the AA post Boyarsky and three AA Files editors, all of whom have ultimately worked through relationships that turn supportive and confrontational. In this I am no different. The conflict for me was that I was brought in to in effect kill, a, kill the magazine and launch a new one. But rather than launching something new, I was very keen to return AA Files to the spirit and character of its first issues. The AA that I like resides in its eclecticism. In the early issues of AA Files, you see this in the coexistence of historians like Anthony Vidler, Robin Middleton, Francis Yates, and Roy Landau, with designers like Peter Cook, Nigel Coates, and Bernard Schumi. Indeed, the prevalence and importance attached to architectural history in this period, generally regarded as the high watermark of the AA's design culture, is initially shocking but ultimately reassuring. And through this historicism, the first 10 years of AA Files play themselves out less against the backdrop of those amazing first paintings by Zaha than they do through the brilliance of numerous essays by Robin Evans. And it was this kind of quality of architectural writing that I wanted to rediscover and re-endorse. Maintaining a certain standard of writing has therefore become my main editorial preoccupation. To everyone who submits proposals to me, or to any of the theorists and historians I work with, I characterize this preoccupation by insisting that all text in AA files should aspire to the characteristics of the essay rather than the paper. By a paper, I mean an academic text that is fundamentally structured through making explicit its place within a long lineage of other texts, whose paragraphs lead from one reference to another, that is meticulously footnoted and whose beginnings are en and ends are in effect the same, setting the context and the agenda into which they are contributing. In contrast, I see the essay as scholarly but not overly academic, or at least not always predicated on academic propriety and weighed down by endless footnotes. That is a bit more cavalier with its sources and references, that is less conciliatory and more iconoclastic, and whose structure is linear, not circular, so that the ends of essays offer ideas and subjects far removed from those introduced at their beginning. Essays almost invariably also have cooler titles than uh, papers. Being a bit academic about this myself, I see these qualities as part of a long, particularly English, essay writing tradition. It was, for example, the English 18th and 19th century writers, William Hazlitt, Charles Lamb, and Walter Pater, who really established the essay form, a tradition that a later generation of English architectural critics and historians all drew upon. John Summerson, Rainer Banham, Colin Rowe, Alan Colquhoun, Robin Evans, all wrote almost exclusively in the essay form. And when I talk to Alan Colquhoun about this now, and about his allegiance to the essay, he always seems slightly nonplussed, you know, as if to say, what other, what other way of writing is there? But for me also, that the essay is a form that works not just for magazine uh, pieces, but for MA theses and even PhDs. You know, I've long thought that the PhD as a piece of writing is about 150 years past its sell-by date. You know, it's a really terrible thing. And you know, every year I have to read these terrible PhDs, and I think one can aspire to something slightly more literary, so that one reads a PhD like one reads a novel. So for, and for most of the writers I work with, it is quite a sort of wrench abandoning the kind of academic traits in sort of trying to produce something that is more essayish. So sometimes, in emphasizing the writingness of architectural writing, I have to do a bit of a Gordon Lish myself in really working with the text supplied to me. So this, ex for example, is, um, is an essay for AA Files by Pier Vittorio Aureli. And it's a bit mean of me putting this up because Pier Vittorio is Italian, so he's obviously going to need a little more help. But I often find that I have to, you know, it's the beginnings uh, and ends of paragraphs that I really work in. Too many academics write uh, sort of in, uh, atomistically, so each, each paragraph is like a little compartment and there's no flow in between paragraphs. So I'm endlessly having to work, sort of smoothing out the junctions between paragraphs. So other than the sort of heavy Lish style editing, uh, at other times a more engaging and authentic voice can be achieved by relying on the spoken rather than the written word. People are generally more articulate when they talk than when they write. I think this can also provide a nice, nice counterpoint to the, to the mania for primary sources and the archive demanded by graduate academic research. 
In contrast, I think an oral archive, interviewing people and letting the idiosyncrasies appear in your text, is a more valid and achievable archival model than the unpublished manuscript. So these are, in, in every issue of A files, I kind of commission a conversation. So these are just two of those conversations. One I did with Chris Pierce with uh, Leon Creer, the sort of big, bad, sort of pantomime villain of architectural, of architectural design. And then my uh, designer, John Morgan, interviewing the filmmaker, Sally Potter. So I'm very keen for these sort of, these conversations, just to sort of lend the magazine a slightly different tone and a different character. And, but I, at the same time, I don't want them to become formulaic. Like, for example, this guy, this is Hans Ulrich Oberst, who, um, who's had a sort of, who's basically copyrighted the whole idea of conversations with artists so that no artistic or intellectual endeavor seems to be ratified unless Hans Ulrich Oberst is wheeled in to talk to the protagonists. The, um, I mean, but all, lots of magazines now have conversations, but, um, and some more successful than others, but the ones I really like, especially always used to like with the Paris Review, conversations with, um, with writers and artists. But of course, alongside a kind of renewed emphasis on the writerly essay and on the spoken word, the thing that helped me convey the vernacular in all senses of the word of A files is its format and design. The physical um, quality of the journal is tremendously important. Acting out a well-rehearsed cliche of contemporary edit editorship, the first thing I did when I took over at A files was to commission a redesign. The idea was not to create something so a la mode that it would have to be redesigned five years later, but to pare the journal down to its basics of its type, image, and colors. In this, I wanted to use the graphic design to help support a shift towards the text and the critic. This is the AA school. Um, for those of you who don't know, the AA is in Bloomsbury in the center of London, and it's basically tucked behind a Georgian facade around a square, Bedford Square. So the AA itself is highly labyrinthine, occupying all of the rooms and um, spaces and hallways of these former houses, grand houses. There's actually now more of these buildings. We're looking now at sort of four of those fronts and there's another three have just been acquired. So I want the graphics of the magazine in a way to somehow mimic the AA itself. In particular, that strange and appealing confluence you get at the school of a kind of residual Englishness overlaid with a kind of polyglot internationalism. So these are just some of the images, image sort of sources I was looking at when I was thinking about the redesign. Particularly, these are um, these are kind of uh, war artists, Edward Borden and um, Eric Revilius, again who have a kind of very particular sensibility and something that is is quite sort of parochial in a way. But I like that sort of parochial nature of it all. I also looked at early covers of the Architectural Review, which was actually in the 40s and 50s, a really radical, really interesting magazine, despite the fact that Pevsner was involved with it. You know, these, this, for example, is our successive issues. That's July 45 and August 40, 45. You know, you'd never see that today of a magazine that totally ta changes its, its masthead, its design, its fonts, typography from issue to issue. Here's a sort of inside page of the AR. Again, a very sort of conventional, but for me, a very appealing kind of graphic model where you separate image from text. You have a big image on the left and you have the text on the right. Here's one a bit later, it's a piece by Sterling on, um, on Ranchamp. Again, playing off um, single colors, just these sort of muddy pink colors and printing images, full bleed on, on title pages. Again, a separation from image from text. All other magazines now integrate the two. So you always see endless uh, thumbnails integrated into the text, which in itself sort of lends itself to a kind of way of writing about architecture where everything is in a sense like a caption. You write a small piece and then there's the image reference and then you go on to the other. So the writing becomes very, very staccato. I like that total separation where you get image and text. And then I also like the kind of more decorative typography too. Again, it's slightly playing into an older English tradition, abandoning that classic uh, architectural staple, the um, sans serif. You know, I like the serif type. So this is just a sort of spread of A files as I inherited it, which I found kind of problematic, not only graphically, but kind of intellectually, partly because it kind of privileges the architect and the designer 
and it diminishes the idea of the critic. So I always wanted to reverse this. So in the past, everything was structured around the architectural project. You know, here, here is, you know, so all of the contributions in AA files used to be just project descriptions written by students or by guest lecturers and with all of that kind of hyperbole that someone describing their own creation sort of indulges in. So I wanted totally to usurp this by structuring everything around the written form, not the visual form. Here's another typical uh, sort of AA file spread when I took, a, took on the editorship. Again, very highly sort of digital, you know, always a digital project. There's usually a kind of underscore in there. No, no word or title can be complete without an underscore. So rather than the architect on the kind of podium noisily declaring their position, I wanted to nurture more critics. Shadow, shadowy, polymathic, misanthropic, solipsistic, autodidactic, slightly grouchy figures. Not, not writers who engage in all that kind of current nonsense of criticality, but writers who are, who are, pro are properly critical in that they offer a critique, who criticize. So I actually, again, sort of to reiterate what I said before, that I found this in the earlier models of AA files. So here you have exactly that. You have a writer or a critic or a historian um, with a, a fairly straightforward, no-nonsense title, images on one side, two-column text on the other. Oh, here's another piece by Andrew Saint. This is from the, the second issue of AA files. Again, very straightforward, text, image. So I was just going to quickly rattle through a few spreads of A-files as I've designed, as I've worked on it with my designer, John Morgan. So here, again, here's one of mine, very much in kind of reference to that sort of early A-files model. Separation of text and image, just a two-column typography, a very sort of straightforward, no-nonsense title. This is about the uh, German architect Ludwig Leo. And these are the, um, each of the issues I did I also abandoned the AA, AA files tradition of putting an image on a cover, partly because I was just getting a barrage of people who wanted to be in the magazine simply because they wanted to be on the cover. So I abandoned that by making just these flat um, f uh, solid color covers with a kind of contrasting color as the table of contents and the contributors page. So I also readily indulge in kind of a mania for sort of florid typography so each issue has a sort of, as a, a font that is actually an abstraction of something else within the magazine, and they use as these display display letters, display initials. This is a piece by a psychoanalyst, Alan Phillips. Here's a piece again by a historian. So again, I'm not, I quite like it when the magazine just totally abandons the image altogether. That's a spread of the magazine, six full columns of just pure type with just one a one word title. Again, that sort of classic sort of mania for the kind of colon title, the title and subtitle is something I want to try and abandon, even though, as you'll see, um, some of them sneak in. But then when I do have an image, I want to use it big. So I use, this is the great, lovely shot of um, Oscar Kokoschka, the artist, S from his sort of, he had a sort of eerie studio overlooking the um, Berlin Wall. So he was painting a famous painting of the Berlin Wall. So Im images too, you know, as I discover you, Everyone is basically charges you for an image now. So my line on that is if I'm going to pay for an image, I'm going to use it big. So I use it across the whole, pa whole, whole page. Again, here's another piece with more sort of display initials. <coughs> Playing off these one color, you know, this is the signature color in the magazine as the last piece, placing images as line art just on this one color. Again, this is my sort of nod to those early A architectural review covers from the 50s. This was a piece I did with um, uh, of uh, Max Bills to coincide with a publication we did. Max Bill famously never wrote in uppercase or used uppercase letters, so we had to set everything in lowercase. And the Swiss insisted on this. They wouldn't give me the images unless I, I, um, I said I was going to write to it in lowercase. Or when I'm doing another piece I, I did on typography and a kind of English typographic vernacular. And again, when I've got a nice image, I'm going to use it big across the page. A 
again, sort of very simple, no-nonsense, very non-academic titles, much more sort of tabloid journalistic titles, which I much prefer, more display initials. And in these two, I play, Enrique would like this, I, I have to play a slightly kind of Olipo style game that these display letters, the I, the H, the J, and the G here, um, I have a typographer who, who gives me these, but he only gives me sort of six or seven. I can't afford a full alphabet. So, so I then have to edit the text to fit the letters he's, he's given me, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually quite difficult. And I, I have to do this without telling the authors because they just don't understand it at all <laughs> when I have to begin a pet sentence with a J. <laughs> and again, when I've got a nice image, I use it big. This was a, a shot I took actually with an underwater camera um, to accompany a piece on um, a 1950s Swiss swimming pool. A photograph that very nearly got me into a fight with the man I'm photographing there, who was bigger out of the pool than he was there. And then finally, I, these are just some other image references. Um, the other thing that I'm sort of drawing upon about in terms of the sort of physical nature of the magazine are these kind of detective novels that were produced in England in the sort of 30s and 40s. And um, they were produced in huge numbers. Uh, they were selling sort of five, 600,000 copies. And they were basically, there were four of them in total, written by this guy, Dennis Wheatley, who has a rather suspect political history. He was a member of the English Nazi party at one point. Um, but the books themselves are, in a sense, dossiers of evidence. So these are, they are actually made up of um, the evidence that you have to go through. So you have to sort of solve the book by actually unpicking all of the evidence. So there's photographs torn up and inserted in little wax paper envelopes that you then have to sort of put back together. I mean, they're amazing publishing enterprises, especially when you think that they're produced in, in runs of 600,000 copies. Or there's little stamps and ticket stubs that you have to sort of pull out and identify and sort of put together as part of a case. Architectural plans photographs, little torn curtains and fabric swatches, letters, stubs. So this is something that I kind of wanted to sort of introduce into AA files. And the other thing I discovered when I took over the magazine is that most people who had the magazine had them all, had every single copy. Um, so that people are really sort of keen on the sort of tactility of it, much, much more than they were on the kind of literary qualities of it. So. I, have to s I feel I have to sort of somehow reward people for kind of t for getting the magazine and keeping them all by offering them something more than just text. I have to offer them some kind of jolly, some kind of gimmick almost. I mean, uh, a printer will always call these specials. So in every magazine, there's always a special. And then the first one I did um, for a piece with Columbia's Jorge Otero Pios, I did a kind of scratch and sniff um, kind of special. He'd done some tremendous research on the glass house and had basically, uh, of Johnson's glass house, and, and, and discovered a series of distinct smells. He'd worked with a perfumier who'd, who created the smell of the house as it was built, the smell of plaster and leather and of brick, and also the smell of the guests. He'd researched um, kind of 1950s men's aftershave and basically produced a composite of that smell. And he'd also done a smell of of um, cigarette smoke, the kind of tobacco they were smoking. So I had these produced and into a vial of perfume and then applied to the magazine. So you had to actually rub the caption and sniff it. That's me sniffing. As for the cigarette one, I placed the actual scent along the cigarette. This is a photograph of Andy Warhol with Philip Johnson. So we could actually screen print the smell onto the cigarette and then sniff it. And they really smell. They still smell. Um, or this is a, a this is a panorama. It's from an old um, 19th, 19th century Baedeker, which is to accompany a piece by Mark Campbell. Again, printing it on a different paper stock. And again, these are real indulgences, and I can only really indulge in these by, in the terms of the privilege of, of of the AA, that I don't have to run any advertising. I can just run A files exactly as I want. Um, but I. I think that they're more than sort of gimmicks. There is something kind of interesting about these little inserts. Here's another one. I, I ran a, a, AD, a section from AD magazine um, in its entirety, one-to-one -one scale, within the magazine. In the same issue, I placed a postcard. Um, it was a piece about postcards, so we put a postcard in. 
that was uh, sent to Alvin Boyarsky, who was a manic postcard collector. And that's the other side. It was from Dennis Crompton, a member of Archigram. The thing I discovered, I mean, I thought that it was tremendously clever, but then, you know, weeks after the magazine itself was published, I had about 30 postcards sent back to me from librarians who all said that, uh, that someone has left a postcard in this magazine. <laughs> Three librarians even tried to send the postcard back to me using a stamp that doesn't exist, you know. It was a printed stamp, and they were, they were trying to reuse that stamp. Again, from the same issue, slightly different, using different coated stocks. This is a colour uh, paper stock to accompany a piece on Gerhard Richter, or a stencil that I placed in the back of the last issue, or a fold-out in the current issue, this bicycle skin. This is called a French fold, and you don't actually cut the paper, where you can place an image almost in a pocket. Again, this causes real havoc with the sort of octogenarian readership of the A-Files who all complain that they have to bring out their bread knives and open up the magazine. Again, or using a different stock. And that's it. it were uh, here at the table just to really uh, as really a process of turning it over to to the audience and to a wider Q&A um, thanks Tom for the presentation that was uh, terrific um, I thought I would just begin by um, touching on a couple of the analogies that you made uh, at the very outset of your talk you, you pointed to the magazine uh, and its relationship to the school and that you thought of AA files as a type of school um, and in the writing that we read this week, um, there's a real emphasis upon uh, both a particular sensibility for quality that you're after and definitely um, an attempt to make writing the priority. But I wanted to push a little or dig a little on the, the kind of editorial process, uh, not necessarily the Gordon Lish process, but in terms of issues. Like if, it, if AA files were a school, what would the decisions be in terms of making the curriculum for that school? Like, how does that kind of process work in terms of actually coming up with the, the foci or the, the, the contents of AA files? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, initially, it's, it's in the absence of a foci that there is no thematic as the other mm -hmm. defining thing about AA files. Right. Again, and it's, it's an implied critique of the AA as I saw it, just as I emphasized the written word as opposed to a kind of visual kind of um, celebration. The AA has always been famous famously good at producing images and less interesting for producing kind of ideas and texts. Mm. So I just wanted to invert that. And similarly, um, the A was always good at, in the sense of branding whatever it introduced and giving a kind of thematic to that. And I wanted to abandon that and show that it, it was a more even, that it's a more kind of pluralistic and a kind of broader church of, mm -hmm. of ideas, all of which are interesting. Right, right. Yeah. And in terms of how that actually comes together in the making of an issue. I mean, I understand the, the kind of critique of thematics as a type of way of organizing a magazine. I think that's an interesting editorial argument to make today. But, but it's part, that's partly also because I got so satiated with the theme through working with Any. I mean, right. it was great work right. editing Any, right. but Any was the definitively themed magazine. Right. And, you know, at that stage too, I was doing my stuff at Princeton and was attending all these conferences and was just getting slightly kind of consumed by, you know, these conferences always under a rather nebulous thematic. And mm. then people present their papers, slightly allude to this theme, and then very quickly get onto their other stuff. Mm. So I'm like, well, you know, it's clearly a ruse, the theme. Why do you need it? So I just cut it all together. Dispense with it all together, right. But logistically, how I edit is just, you know, it, it really is just sort of grabbing anything I can or anything that I hear about mm. that, you know, through my 
experience of, of um, studying and teaching in the States and friends I've made here. And then mm. I have a kind of network of people I just phone up and mm. or texts I hear about that other people are working on. Or but there's also, the A has a huge public program of talkers who are always coming through the school. You know, right. There's three or four events every week. Mm -hmm. So I can just pick and choose from those too. So you're editing the AA in a sense. Uh, like well, like it, it can, it can, the kind of cart can lead the horse at the same time, mm. but where you can, you can commission a, a, t um, a lecturer to come to the AA and give a presentation, and then you can grab that lecture afterwards as an essay. Mm. But you know, all of the, that's what's wonderful about the AA that you can actually initiate these things. But it just means it's more work. Yeah, um, I'd happily do that mm. Mm. because. The A files, as it was sold to me, was that they wanted it to be much more celebratory of the A in a kind of PR kind of way. So they wanted the the uh, lecture program to be, in effect, the table of contents. Hmm. But I wanted to be free to actually choose anyone I wanted outside of the AA too. I don't like that kind of hard hard um, division between what's in and what's outside the AA. Right. I mean, it is a private school, and I think I didn't want it to become, you know, a sort of private members' club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Pat, during, during that, I mean, like, if we take a look to the first issue, uh, first second issue of uh, uh, the AA files, was intended to kind my, of my one or the first one ever? No, ever. Uh, the first ones with Boyarsky, uh, Robin Middleton, and um, and all these people. Seems that the, the AA was uh, the AA files was trying to summarize a bit what was going on in the school, you know, with the exhibition reviews, the work of the students, and then the work done by the faculty there, Robin Evans among others, and. Mm. Um, it seems in the, in, your uh, in the edition and the explanation you have uh, done today, part of the work of the edition uh, uh, that took place in, the, um, uh, uh, in your work, um, uh, what it has done is just to get rid of some of, the, of those contents, and it seems like the one that's losing in the picture is the work of the students. And I was wondering if uh, there's a way that the work of the students is, represent uh, is represented in the new AA files, and uh, how, is it because, um, uh, in, a, uh, in a way, I would say that one thing is to formulate a criticism towards the school, another thing is to formulate a criticism to, towards the, the work of the students that sometimes do not overlap and sometimes do not run in parallel. Sure. I mean, straight away, I kind of abandon the idea of, of student projects going into the AA files. Again, largely because, not because of the images, but because of the text. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I am, students are writing for AA files in the form of MA theses turned as essays, PhDs, I mean, uh, other students are contributing. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to kind of create a kind of um, tabula rasa before I then rebuilt it up again, because mm -hmm. I want to establish a kind of quality threshold. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's a sort of culture of, of, of um, expectation where students produce an, uh, an award-winning design and then they want to expect it to see it in AA files. Mm -hmm. Whereas I want to s I'm only gonna put it in AA files if it's any good. But it's, but it's difficult for me, I admit, that my kind of Achilles heel in this is how to absorb design projects in. So the AA files in the 80s was absorbing in work from Coates and Zaha and Kohlhaas and all of these people. And I still haven't quite sort of found a kind of forum for that by insisting on the kind of the, the text. Do you think that this quality threshold is kind of achieved through a definition of what might be called like the, the figure of the public intellectual as opposed to the academic, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, you know, the dryness of those kind of papers. I, I mean, from yeah, I mean some I things but it's always those kind of public, it's, you know, kind of the New Yorker model or the New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books. These are the kind of journals I'd always aspire to. I mean, I don't read any architectural journals because yeah. they're not a great read, frankly. <laughs> you know, I just want it to be something people pick up and there's always something worthwhile in there that the layman can understand as much as the kind of professional. Again, again because if you look at architectural <coughs> magazines of architectural theory, they're all written in a kind of language um, unique mm. only to themselves, which so doesn't lend itself to good writing, I think. It's a question of the audience, too. I mean, to whom? Again, but the audience is very tiny. Yeah. I mean, uh, any, we only produced any in 1,500 copies or something mm. like that, because there's basically 1,500 people who read that stuff. Mm. Mm. Or can and understand. And it. AA files is how many? Well, AA files is again, it's slightly different. It's in 4,000, but the, the AA is, as I said in that 2020 text, the AA is a weird thing. It is a school, but mm -hmm. it's also a club. Yeah. Um, and the club aspect of it is, is basically an alumni organization. So typically after graduating from the AA, you hang around and you join the AA. Mm -hmm. So the membership of the AA, as part of their membership, get AA files. Right. So in many ways, 
it sounds like you see the AA files as a type of mediator in that sense, right? That it's, it's not representing the school, it's kind of a place that brings things from the outside into the AA and mm -hmm. where you kind of select material from the AA to push out, right, exactly. via the magazine. But this w these were all the battles I was having from the outset when I wanted to go more, make it more outward looking rather than inward. Because mm -hmm. I think if you can produce essays and articles and texts about architecture in the sort of general kind of holistic sense, that are interesting, then then it's tot then it reflects well on the AA, mm -hmm. rather than the more kind of literal kind of um, inward closeted reflection, which is simply this guy comes and talks to the AA, and here's the transcript of his talk. Right, right. So I in the spirit of uh, opening it up to you guys, we're going to keep this first section really short and turn it over to the the general questions now. Again, I wanted to be deliberately kind of um, perverse in, in giving the AA something it had never had, you know, just forcing you to look at just text, forcing you to read the text. I mean, it did cause certain problems that, you know, there's a lot of older members of the AA who are sort of squinting when I'm reading, when I'm setting out six columns of type at sort of ten, nine point or whatever. Um, but but this is what, you know, a newspaper is set in. This is what the N N New York Review of Books or London Review of Books is set is set in that form, and it's it's not so much the kind of kind of pyrotechnics or the kind of the physiognomy of actually reading it. It's it's the culture that it brings forth. It's actually you know it's a flag. It's a flag that's suggesting that the text is is much more important than the image. And again, this is something that is it's it's going to take time for people to realise that. And I'm being deliberately kind of fundamentalist about it, but it's gonna I'm going to step back as well because. You know, I also logistically can't produce so much tech editing this amount of text twice a year. There's a huge amount of work. There's a hundred hundred thousand words of text in each issue. So it's like doing a book twice a year. But I think but that point I made about you know academic writing always being very staccato is I think has a graphic consequence in terms of text image, text image, text image. Um, and I really just hate that model of academic writing. And it's also born out of that, that model where the actual act of writing is sort of incidental. It's a sort of scientific paradigm that mm. you see all over PhDs now, where it's basically writing up an experiment. You know, you simply gather the material, you gather the archive, and then you just document the actual act or the history of the retrieval of that stuff. You mm -hmm. don't actually craft it into some writerly form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we pass the mic? Yeah. Just because we're recording all of this. <laughs> uh, okay, well, you earlier you praised like architectural review and how it was trying to be cover to cover. Is that even possible, or like in the realm of possibility, can someone perform that to the other side? Or yeah, sure. I mean, I could do it, but I mean, it's not something. So I, you know, my covers are fairly rigorous. The colors are the only thing that changes. I mean. I don't want it to be a literal kind of model. You know, I don't want to copy that entirely. But I like that kind of, you know, I'm slightly resistant to the sort of brand idea that, you know, the masthead as brand and the kind of the allegiance certain magazines have to their own kind of sensibility as if nothing is, as if everything is sort of sac is sacred somehow. And I like that kind of cheekiness that the, a magazine like the Architectural Review had by, by changing the template every issue. But it's for me, it's something that is, I mean, I can technically do it, but again, it would put, for me, too much emphasis on the design. You know, I, I, I find it quite useful just hiding behind a single color cover. So the only decision at the end with the cover is just what color is it? Um, well, that one works. <laughs> Earlier you spoke about the editor as a collector, and this is touching on um, the point you made I'm still interested in sort of what the agenda, the, the, 
the long-term agenda is and maybe the editor as a curator and sort of what your opinion about issue to issue and you know where the future is for you and what you're trying to well do. Well again, curating is kind of one of those words like editing though that's kind of overused a little bit. Um, and you know, you see it everywhere now. The, uh, people talk about curating a project instead of designing a project. They talk about, you know, um, uh, editing, a, you know, a, an exhibition, editing, anything, everything. It's, not, it's never sort of designing anymore. It's mm -hmm. never writing. It has the sort of grandeur of, edit of cura curatorial projects. And, you know, there's so many M MA programs now that are sort of about a kind of curatorial agenda or an editorial agenda. And I quite like to sort of, that's partly why I don't have an editorial as well. There's never, I sort of hide, hide all of that because I just don't like that kind of slight pomposity of standing on a podium. I am an editor, you know, announcing my agenda. I prefer it a bit shadowy. So <laughs> you've been, you've just said you're very fundamentalist in terms of the principle, in terms of the process, in terms of the look. You've been very, very in control of everything. Absolutely, but I'm trying to do that without me being up front, you know, about, about me being there. You know, I don't want to, that's again why I don't want to have an editorial. I don't want to, or the, you know how you see um, edited by in various books is really big, big letters on the front of a, of a publication or the colophon, which is where you have the details of the publisher and the editor. It's always quite typographically big in a magazine now. It's quite big and bold. And I want to sort of diminish that. So you just c straight into the magazine just to read the text. So it's just about quality. Get enough interesting people, put it together in a quality format, and let everyone else figure out the user. To yeah, and they, they can figure out what thematic that might actually be there. They can figure out you know, what agenda is being played out, what relationships might have happened between these seemingly arbitrary relationships, so that they just in engage with it like you would like a newspaper or any other kind of form of a sort of with a plural, a plurality of voices. question. <laughs> I mean, uh, as an uh, architectural society. Maybe you should repeat the question. I don't think we heard it. Uh, I don't think we all heard it. Okay. Shout it out. Yeah. Chuck that other one. It doesn't work. Um, it was such a strong distinction between the critics and their text and the architect and their images, um, who do you think really leaves the most lasting impression on our society, the architect or the critic? I, I, well, I've never really thought about it as a kind of, as a kind of competition. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm not an architect. I train as an architect, but I'm, I'm, I'm a critic, really. And I've always, uh, and again, it's partly an English thing, but much more in the States. When I was studying in the States, architectural history and theory and criticism is is much more present and central to the teaching of architecture because you know America is basically built by builders not architects mm. <coughs> whereas in Europe the architect as practitioner is a much much stronger entity so all design schools in Europe are all about design and very 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 peripherally are about history and theory and other critical disciplines um, so it's a totally sort of separate world where they're much more integrated here, designers and historians and critics are much more integrated in the US than they are in England. So it's a, again, it's a sort of provocation when, you know, architects have their design magazines with pictures of buildings that they curate and they, you know, they stage every aspect of it, indigo skies, car tail lights disappearing off, long shutter speeds, total absence of human life form. You know, they're controlling that whole thing. You know, I just, that's not a world I want to sort of take, get into, you know, or, or compete with. Right. 
market for, for all for people. Well, kind of logistically, it's for, it's for the students and the members of the AA. I mean, they're 90% of my readers. So there are people within architectural training or students or ex-students. But I much prefer the idea of it becoming like a kind of NPR style, BBC style, like a, a common voice, like a common vocabulary about people just interested in kind of intellectual life, whether it's you know, music or film or architectural art. It's just a kind of cultivated language, and architecture is one of those. Mm. You know, the architects I've always liked are those people who can absorb those things <coughs> into, their, into their way of life. I mean, Peter Eisman, whatever you think about him, it was, for me, when I was working with him and teaching with him, it was a great experience because he reads novels, he listens to music, he goes to the movies, and they're absorbed into the way he teaches and thinks about life. Mm. Again, counter to that sort of total separation you have, I'm a practicing, practicing ar architect and I'll just do what I do, you know. Mm. I just like that, and again, that's in terms of the school as well, that I think that a school shouldn't be simply about a practical training, it should be about teaching you just about good things in life, in whatever artistic form they're in. Mm. I, mean that, I mean, just building on that question about the, the audience, and maybe the question is not audience, but of a certain kind of public, let's say, um, in, in the 2020 piece that we read, there was an interesting moment where um, you played off uh, criticality, which you question as a kind of self-nominating uh, gesture, and literalism as this sort of Peter Cook stands in as the figure of, we just need to get back to the objects. Um, and in some ways, I wonder if this kind of pleasure that you're seeking, both in the, in the act of writing and the craft of writing and in reading, is that sort of third position. That, uh, or maybe not a third position, but something that's neither of those. It's a kind of a strategy of its own to position architecture, not necessarily uh, in either vein, but through a new kind of pleasure of, of reading and writing. Is that, yeah. would that but be that right? And it's just a sort of experiential pleasure, you know, because it's not branded in a way, mm. you know, by its literalism or its abstraction. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of enjoying it. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's independent of any kind of other overriding agenda, right? I mean, is the is the pleasure sh purely a kind of pleasure principle approach, or is there is there something that no? But there's also kind of a pedagogic agenda going on too. Okay. You know that partly because also I'm drawing on a lot of graduate and doctoral research. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of these essays are coming out of chapters from PhDs and right. stuff like that. So that's all for a, also a reflection on whatever t the currents of PhD writing is. Okay. So, but I'm, I have to slightly, you know, smooth out the form of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's a mediation between that realm of research and a kind of aspiration towards a wider public, right? Uh, it's but actually, it's the, the, m the more literal is the more difficult for me. I mean, I'm, I would happily kind of put more people in front of an object and encourage them to write about that object mm. and send it to me. But people are much more, the, the, the writers I'm dealing with seem much more willing to deal with abstract things. Yeah. So in one sense, I agree with Peter Cook that I think getting back to things would be rather more interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a nice exercise, you know, parking yourself in front of the thing and writing about it. Mm. 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 Uh, hi. Uh, I suppose that your goal as every editor is, is, uh, is to, to, to be read as much as possible. I mean... Uh, Somebody who reads a magazine of a file uh, can view an hierarchy in the in the text style, which is uh, limited. Excuse me for the word that I'm using uh, to the use of a title, uh, a caption, and the text. Uh, for example, you don't use any big letters, which uh, re make a resume a resume of, of the text. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, if in, in this way, if uh, you think that uh, more uh, articles may, may be read from the reader. Um, I, I, I'm trying to explain myself. In nowadays, th we, ha we, have, uh, we don't have much time as readers. So if you just flip a magazine uh, which has uh, a text si style more like uh, content, uh, putting con um, the contents quite full. Uh, it gives the opportunity to the reader to decide which uh, subject 
uh, interest him and uh, spend more time reading this article. In, in, in the other way that you are using, maybe the reader needs to spend more time to read more things. Which no, is your goal? The latter. I want people to spend more time reading things. But I also, th I don't want to ma make type and typography masquerading as images, you know. As you said, just setting, setting type in big, bold letters, describing in, in a summary, in a synopsis, what the article is about. I just want them to start reading it. If they don't, that's partly why I really pay attention to the beginnings of an essay. The beginnings should always get you in, you know, mm. like a novel. They mm. should just get you into the text. And if they don't, then, then stop reading. <laughs> read another one. <laughs> You know, just <coughs> like any like any novel, you wouldn't continue to read something if it isn't kind of you find engaging. But it's also a response to that kind of academic tendency in all theses is or PhDs where there's that really interminable beginning where you say what you're going to say. You describe your project and the position of your project within a whole kind of lineage of other bodies of literature. You know, I just want to kind of <coughs> call me Ishmael. <laughs> beginning, you know. <laughs> I want, uh, it's much more literary paradigms I'm aspiring, you yeah. know, I'm following. Yeah. Um, I, w I wanted to ask you the same for the, the pictures that you are using. Uh, usually with a diagram you can say more things than with a picture or than with a text with a lot of words. Do you, do you use uh, diagrams? What, what do you mean by a diagram? schematic uh, representations of thoughts and no <laughs> that is generally you know <coughs> you know i'm not i don't want to present myself as too much as a sort of al qaeda of text here you know I'm <laughs> there's still <laughs> packed full of images in in a files and you know the image is still vitally important but it is also that you know images now always have a price mark against mm. them and you have to pay for images and pay a lot of money to get images and publishing and copyright to clear those images um, but when I do get good images I'm definitely going to use them and and I also encourage writers to to change their relation so that their relationship with their subject uh, sort of m moves up and down so sometimes they can talk about bigger ideas more sort of meta ideas and then sometimes descending into the image and microscopically kind of offering a, a kind of analysis of so something very sort of forensic and small scale. I think all writing like is, is actually has a sort of strange sort of um, varying kind of distance to the thing that it's actually writing about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sheik. Uh, yeah. <coughs> sorry. May I? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to go back to the question of the relationship between the magazine and the school. Um, I'm, I'm really surprised with the amount of times you put your first person to start a sentence when you talk about a magazine. And uh, when I put a first person? You're, you talk in first person about your, your, it's basically your magazine and your taste and your decision, uh, almost in every other sentence. Uh, and uh, it's a phrasing like, I, I do this because I like it. Uh, so kind of the magazine becomes kind of uh, exercise, exercise on, on, on taste, basically your taste, and um, that's a quite uh, uh, surprising uh, strategy for a magazine, of a school magazine since, or not since, but you know, what, what one kind of, the more, com uh, kind of the more, it's kind of, how I would say, uh, and um, uh, what we'll expect like uh, of an architectural magazine from coming from a school is that the, actually there will be some uh, reference to the school itself and uh, as uh, Pep was mentioning before, that the, those magazines and a lot of these publications in, in the school in the, at AJ will uh, the, they appear uh, some sort of reflection of the school and some sort of broadcasting of what's going on in the school. So the school was built of all these individuals having a lot of taste and uh, organizing themselves in units and having a super specific production uh, based on their own personal project and those things will be summarized in some sort of uh, kind of uh, mechanisms of broadcasting. There will be, at, uh, I think Irene already kind of shown in you know, looking at the TV, AA TV, or mm -hmm. you know, mechanisms that the school will put together in order to actually make these things public. And in a way, the way you describe your, your, your uh, magazine is, sounds like one, an another unit. And what you were mentioned before, that we will, you would like to give some objects to people so they will give you an answer. 
is literally, I mean, you're taking the position almost of the studio critic at AAA, where you're basically, you know, asking a specific people to do projects about things that are super specific. Um, but that's, but I, that's an editorial conceit, though. That's what editors do, no? Yeah, but um, now, now that the model of the studio more or less has become a homogeneous in any kind of school of architecture in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, I will wonder how specific is your model to the AIA. So basically, how difficult will it be for you to actually do exactly the same magazine in any other school? Because uh, what it seems to me right now, I, I know that a lot of the questions are vernacular, it, like you like, refer to, I'm trying to do the opposite especially, but uh, at the same time, it seems that by being so close to the model of the unit, you are becoming a kind of completely independent from the school, and rather than actually becoming a window for the school, you are actually one of the products of the school. Well, in, in many ways, it is like the unit, but one, c in the sense that a unit, the unit, the studio system at the AA is divided into little autonomous groups of 12 students with two tutors that have their own financial independence and their own identity and their own kind of brand and their own pedagogic model. Um, and in many ways, AFRs is like that, you know, that I have total authority to do it however I like to do it. But, but it's also the opposite of the unit because in the sense that the unit, in the sense, is a market model. The unit model is simply propagating s an interest in architecture that people then subscribe to by taking that unit. So it's very much sort of um, respondent to the currents of architectural fashion. That's why, at the, again, at the A, the A gets always criticized for the kind of preponderance of the kind of parametricism because it's simply following fashion because mm. it is a market model. So again, I don't want to, in that sense, A files is totally anti a market model. It is insisting on, on a certain quality threshold and a certain eclecticism that I'm imposing. It isn't totally loose in terms of just uh, publishing whatever is happens to be passing through the door. It is edited in that sense that is, you know, there is some kind of, um, there's some kind of m mechanism, some editorial control going on there. Mm. It, but, it's, but it's also a difficult one. I mean, this is, it's also the luxury of the AVA is very willing to sort of throw a project to someone and let them do it. I mean, that's, that's what's nice about the AA. You know, you have that that total authority to do it. Yeah. And it's consistent with all of the other editors of the AA. That's what's nice about AA files. You look at all of the four editorships of the four editors and they're four, it's four completely different magazines. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's pretty, uh, in a way, it's just, would you think that uh, the fact that such a magazine exists in such an institution, you know, this with those nuances, you know, in language, in the uncompromised use of references, stands for a certain cri uh, crisis within those kind of uh, uh, parametric um, model studios, you know, like uh, d d d d those kinds of traditional studios. Well, I, I like provoking. I mean, that's, it's like bear baiting. It's so <laughs> easy, yeah. you know, provoking a parametricist. Yeah. But um, but do you think you know, like only the possibility that the, the magazine, as you are doing it there, that I mean, only the possibility of existing, you know, reflects certain crisis, you know, in the, within the certain. Something yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I want to. I want it to in in sort of. So that's where there is a thematic. Yeah, mm. if I want to precipitate a crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Can I? Sorry, sorry. Yes, the last thing. Uh, that will that will place you again in in the market. Basically, I mean, this school went uh, six, no, <coughs> eight years ago through a crisis. Columbia. A crisis, Columbia. Yeah, through a crisis of digital technology. That so basically we will sit in this auditorium and 80% uh, of the pr students, uh, the professor presenting the studio lottery will show amazing Maya slash 3D Max renderings on the, win on, the, on the screen moving a lot and you know there was a reaction that actually probably a lot of people here sitting is part of it and actually there was an a, a important, uh, you know, I think a, a big interest in a lot of the stuff that you're talking about and that you're like actually you're your magazine features. So I, I, I don't totally uh, kind of understand your, your claim that, you know, by not doing parametricism, you're out of the market or you're not fashionable uh, enough. Because I, I, I will say that you're the, the, the claim of doing a magazine on taste 
is actually a claim of doing the magazine that you know knows more, much more about fashion than the people that is is far more sophisticated on, on its fashion than the people that is in the studios. Meaning that you know it's actually recognizing much by much much better as a connoisseur the kind of the architectural fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I would, but I wouldn't. I I'm happy to, you know, to to sort of propagate a kind of a fashionable agenda like that, or to be part of a kind of language of fashion and style. I mean, it clearly has its own fashion. I mean, this isn't something entirely for me. I work with a designer, you know, a very good designer who who gives me that stuff, you know. But 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 again, it's just it's just such a nice provocation, you know. Give it again, the A was it was always monocultural, and I think it's becoming more pluralistic. It's becoming more heterogeneous, and mm. I think uh, A files is absolutely nothing is isn't leading that. But it's it, it's there's going to come a point fairly soon when I can start to engage with the school again. But I don't want to do that in terms of hey everybody, I'm engaging right now. You're allowed into the magazine. You're now worthy of the magazine. I think it should always just pick up upon what's interesting and what's good. Uh, how independent are you from the school agenda and how far goes your freedom of speech? Um, fairly independent. Um, I mean, I've, I'm given a budget and I've been told to produce two issues a year and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't, sh I don't have any editorial it's not peer reviewed. I don't have any editorial consultation. I don't show layouts or potential tables of contents to any other authority. So I just do it. I mean, mm. it's partly to kind of um, play off the kind of main, you know, the A, like any other institution, likes production. It likes stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, if you produce a spine of a book or a magazine, it's, it's more stuff. That's the I'm prime stuff when under Brett's in that picture. It's all spine. It's right? yeah, yeah. It's, it's spinal. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like one of those lawyers' offices where it's actually not real. You know, right. It's like a kind of wallpaper <laughs> of spines. But but he's also you know very supportive. So he likes me and he sort of trusts me to, to generate the stuff. Yeah. To what extent he engages with it, I'm not sure about. But he gives me carte blanche to just to do that. Yeah. But it's you know it's a ticking clock. You know someone's gonna <laughs> come and get me any moment. <laughs> Is there any censorship from your board? No, none whatsoever. Well, there was once, but um, oh. yeah, when I um, wanted to publish a critique of an AA exhibition. Uh, tell us more. <laughs> there, was <laughs> 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 there was an AA exhibition on graphic design curated by the art director of the AA, and I hired a writer to write about it who criticized it, and that was pulled. <laughs> that was the Forms of Inquiry exhibition? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. When during the process was that reviewed and pulled? Though? What's that? Quite close. When during the process was that reviewed and pulled, if you said you're totally autonomous? Yeah, that was actually in the very first issue I did. I mean, the very f before the magazine was redesigned, I did two issues under the existing template just to kind of find my feet. Mm. So that was in the first issue. Mm -hmm. And has it, con uh, I mean, has that at all... Um, dissuaged you from dealing with, let's say there's another exhibition at the AA that you would be critical of. Um, do you now kind of uh, shy off of that, knowing that it's going to be a bit of a hot potato issue? Slightly, but also I slightly shy away from the idea of, again, it used to be arranged by in a sort of tripartite distinction between projects, reviews, and lectures. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the back of the magazine was always exhibition reviews, book reviews, and I just found that slightly pedestrian, so I've got rid of all of that. Yeah. So I don't really commission any reviews of any AA exhibitions. I just right. don't think it needs that publicity. Right, right. You just end run around that whole issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, editing an architecturally focused uh, magazine, how do you draw the line of distinction of what's uh, architecturally relevant? Well, I just, I just put stuff in that I think, you know, if people have got a good idea, if there's, if they're onto research that I find interesting that other people aren't doing, if they're using image archives that haven't been published before, if they're addressing certain 
you know, buildings or artifacts that I think are worth addressing. Um, there are people within the AA who I think need, have got a voice and they need to find their voice. These are all the kind of criteria I'm kind of employing. You mentioned sources that you kind of get a lot of your info from often. Is it, is it typically like in the architectural community or is it anything social or political that still can kind of have this relationship to architecture? No, it's, uh, I mean, again, it's not, I'm not simply restricting it to architectural historians or architects. You know, they've, I've had filmmakers, choreographers, psychoanalysts, you know, people from all walks of life, you know, other kind of writers contributing. And I'd like much, much more of that. Again, which is partly a sort of return to this older model of the AA, where mm. the lecture series at the AA was not always the great hero practitioner. Mm -hmm. I mean, now at the AA, when Rem or Zaha lectures, they, you have them queuing around the block. But when you have, you know, a rather avant-garde, you know, writer or a political theorist, you get four people there. Mm -hmm. But I think again, that's why it should be an academic diagram. You should place in front of an audience someone who you think will be good for their education, you know, mm. who's going to give them some good ideas. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of BBC, a very old BBC model. You know, the BBC in the sort of 50s are sort of under Reith, a Reithian model, which is, again, an anti-market model of the BBC put on the BBC programs that they think is good for the nation. Right, which included lectures by Pevsner and others, right? Architecture was part of that Absolutely, general conversation. because it was yeah. part of a kind of cultivated conversation of the arts and the humanities. Right, as right. one of those things. Right, right. <coughs> so, uh, do you feel like it's somewhat limiting or resistant to change the fact that it's so prescribed by one man? You know, like being you, and as the editor, like as far as the paradigm and like the shifts that occur in architecture, and you um. know, like when there is a need to make a major shift in aesthetics or the content, the fact that it's driven so hardly by you. But how would that, I mean, I, how would that sort of moment appear to me? Do you think there's going to be a kind of road to Damascus <laughs> experience of a kind of ray <laughs> of light and a kind of new architectural moment? No, I mean, like, I feel like, um, sorry, I feel like that's why I feel like uh, a lot of editors are a little bit uh, um, hesitant to be uh, very forceful about the content because they're scared that there, there might be some issues or some conversations that they might miss. So there is a certain level of diversity and, you know, and kind of a hands-off approach, whereas you seem to be very kind of specific and rigorous about what you find interesting. And, like, you know, for the field of architecture, do you feel like that's... Yeah, but it's at that kind of almost personal level. It isn't at the level of what I think is going to become the next great theoretical, you know, or kind of practical kind of shift in architecture. It, it, it's, not, it's not a sort of religious kind of experience. I'm not kind of a prophet. And, t you know, again, this is what the architectural theme, I mean, volume does this all the time. It's basically, hey, this is what's around. You don't know it yet, but we're telling you this mm -hmm. is coming your way. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole kind of propaganda associated with AMO is about telling you what you don't yet know, you know, right. what's around the corner. Mm -hmm. So crystal ball model, I, again, <laughs> life's too short. <laughs> but let's, okay, I don't want to be the defender of volume because I'm not, uh, I actually have nothing to do with volume, but uh, for the sake of argument, um, Let's say that you know one of the arguments uh, embedded in that is that the the kind of distributed editorial model that volume has between an office, uh, a cultural institution like Arquis, and a school like this, would be precisely to argue that um, it's the job of those organs to identify areas of relevance to architecture yeah. and to make those broadly accessible. No, I really like that diagram. And I think what uh, Anaba was saying in his, his own 2020 piece was mm -hmm. really spot on. I don't mm -hmm. have any issue with that. Okay. But it's not necessarily something I would run to the newsstand to buy. Right, right. But I think it, it's a totally valid model. Right. It's just not your model. It's a kind of, you're trying to articulate exactly. a different model, right? Again, yeah. one of the pressures on me, people kept s saying, hey, why don't you do a guest editorship? Why don't you invite certain people to guest editor, mm -hmm. edit the thing? And I'm... Unthinkable. <laughs> <laughs> no! 
<laughs> out of my cold dead hands. <laughs> okay. Cheers, Eric. Uh, one more question about uh, editorial choice. Um, you have mentioned uh, news organizations. You have mentioned news organizations, uh, PBS, uh, BBC, or even the Hollywood version of uh, the Washington Post editor. And I'm wondering if uh, you ever feel as an editor a, a sort of responsibility of the kind that the news editor would have uh, in the sense that there is something out there that you have to document anyhow whether you like it or not. So uh, if you mm. want beyond uh, uh, a question of taste or what you or even what you find interesting uh, but if it ever happens a situation no, where let's say something is uh, news uh, let's say or even something ugly but that well, so uh, my answer to that I mean that's a key question and it's something it's a real moral dilemma for me and it's the answer to that is it's the Patrick Schumacher issue <laughs> so Patrick Schumacher is on a kind of global bender right now kind of propagating his book on and his his sort of his par his agenda of parametricism. So he's giving this lecture. He's produced this book, which is flying out of the AA bookshop. I mean, mm. thousands of copies are going. Everyone carries it around. At Princeton, everyone used to carry around thousand plateaus and uh, right. the <laughs> capitalism of schizophrenia. And but now it's just but everyone has Schumacher's book. Wow. So I'm like, what am I going to do about this? You know, mm. do I have a, get a hire someone who really takes them to pieces? Do I have some kind of engaged debate? I mean, it's a real problem for me. You know, what am I going to do? Mm. And I haven't sorted it out, resolved it yet. Um, but I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to commission someone to, to write about parametricism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the kind of safe choices, you go for a kind of Bernard Cash kind of response where you, you in a sense, position it historically, or you talk about the computational through architectural history, where you have an essay about Vitruvius, and you show that these people's ideas was actually grounded in something rather more kind of fundamental. But I think it's too easy, easy an option. Right. Mm -hmm. You're looking for something more sharp. Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to write a piece for me about parametricism, I see a few oh. people ship it in. volunteering yeah. already. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions here, and one in the back. Or three. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned uh, having received many contributions from people who are working in many different disciplines and across many different fields. And I was just wondering whether there was one particular discipline that you found particularly surprising um, in which they were highlighting resonances that were unexpected or unprecedented with architecture. Well, psychoanalysis was the big one for me, the piece I ran by a psychoanalyst. And what was their argument? He was, he was talking about the idea of getting lost so it was a piece about losing, you know, about being lost. Mm. And was there a, a great deal of translating that you felt that you had to bring to the table as an editor in terms no, of terminology? No, again, I, or I, don't, I don't want it to be like a kind of priest whereby, in a sense, I present a kind of allegory. Someone's playing football, someone's climbing a tree, and then at a certain point I, s I talk about, I introduce Jesus, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I ex explain the parable. I don't want to be a kind of translator in that sense. So I want the analyst to speak as an analyst, the choreographer, the fashion designer to speak their own language, you know, and for other people to understand the architectural resonances of that. Not that there's always a kind of architectural component at all. Again, this is one of the joys of the AA. It isn't a sort of practical training you get mm. there. It's a very, very kind of wide sort of understanding of what architecture is. I mean, the head of architectural history at the AA is a Mark Cousins, a man who has who very little understanding of architecture in terms of bricks and mortar, but right. a huge understanding of it as a sort of allegory of everything else. Mm -hmm. One question here and then one in the back. Well, I was just wondering what contemporary magazines are you reading that you admire from time and century and you, that you'd rush out to? Yeah, again, it's a s tricky one because it's a sort of slippery slope, you know, that there's so many magazines out there and I just don't want to, and there's so many other good things to read for me that I just, I just like reading novels, you know, I like reading fiction and I can't <coughs> spend so much time reading architectural magazines, so I tend to kind of not read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't read any blogs either. Okay, and you say you don't read any books either? Blogs. Blogs. Blogs, okay. Um, yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> I, I, I used to work at, at Any, and then Cynthia, who's the editor of Any, then, and now Log, sends, we have a kind of exchange, so we often talk about the, the editorial project and forthcoming issues, so I'm always sort of engaging with her. But in terms of other magazines? Nothing. But there's Not just so time. much other stuff to read, you know? And I like a kind of bookcase that is full of books. You know, there's certain kind of people who have a kind of bookcase full of magazines. Mm. Like <laughs> buy some books. Wait, so you don't like magazines? <laughs> you <laughs> publish a magazine. Tragic paradox. That seems, yeah. Cr okay. Um, I guess my other question is do you see potential for this formula working after your term's up? You said four editors, four different magazines. Do you see oh, potential for this? It'll definitely be thrown out altogether, that kind of model. I so think. you don't want any longevity to this? No, I don't mind. I think it's. Not, I'd be interested to see what would happen, you know, as a sort of scientific experiment. But the history of the AA tells me that, you know, or the history of any architectural magazine is that the person who succeeds you absolutely tramples on your memory. And <laughs> that's why they commission redesigns. That's why they throw everything out. Oh. Mm. There was a There's question in the back. There's a question over there. And the question over there. Um, I am trying to make this sort of comparison between uh, your AAA files and contents, uh, content uh, by OMA. And I kind of see them uh, at the opposite side of the spectrum. So uh, content trying to be a magazine, well, it is a book. And do your, um, num your AAD files want to be a book? And uh, aside from this, I've been seeing um, a lot of um, willing to provoke in general, in this school and in the field lately. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, as you, as you just said, you know, this is sort of an experiment. My, mm, what I'm doing here, it's meant to be um, provoking and radical, but it's not going to happen after I leave or, you know, it's not going to last very long. So really, since you've been seeing lots of things in architecture lately, are we trying to provoke? Is this really the paradigm of the 2011 architecture? Because I've been hearing um, that a lot. And the being radical, you can do it from different points of view, and you're doing it from uh, a very interesting one. But yeah, I'm wondering if you know, I this just is think it's where I we're like going. That kind of Again, it comes partly from my allegiance to the essay, which I think is always slightly polemical, has a polemic. And when a conclusion concludes with a kind of critique, it concludes with something rather iconoclastic, something that challenges convention. Again, counter to that rather conciliatory kind of, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that kind of classic academic essay, which is always sort of on the fence. It's always just presenting a series of ideas rather than really suggesting it's one or the other. I just. You know, but I often, when I work with my MA students on writing, it's I like that kind of any writing that basically deals with with um, with dichotomies and shows that black is white or white is black, but simply invert something. And if you can, in terms of the rhetoric of your presentation, prove that and sort of convince a readership that is actually the opposite of what you think, then I think it's an interesting it's an interesting way to approach things. And I think it makes it more memorable as well. You'll remember an essay if it really challenges your conventional w wisdom on something. Do you see this uh, radical idea as a mainstream um, architect, something that is becoming mainstream somehow within architecture? Well but now it's to make a to difference, mainstream. you have to be radical. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know about a collective, but it's what I like doing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I I actually agree with that. But you know, it's I'm I'm kind of seeing that maybe it's not. That much of a provocation. But I understand. <laughs> but I understand <laughs> your point entirely. If everyone is doing that, then there's nothing more exhausting than someone who's endlessly suggesting they're reinventing the wheel or whatever. Exactly. That's what I was. <laughs> so I hear you. Okay. There was one question we have in the back. A last there. question. Uh, thank, thank you for the uh, lecture. Uh, is it Lucendi? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, 
I guess that uh, an editor needs to decide, uh, along with other criteria, of course, the originality uh, of an idea or a project, and therefore decide to publish it. And um, it seems that uh, this is a safe ground when it comes to uh, past decades, uh, where originality can be seen uh, uh, in another way after years. But uh, it seems to be quite an unsafe ground when it comes to co contemporary thought. So uh, I would like to ask you, uh, according to you, what constitutes uh, originality uh, today uh, in contemporary thought? What do you mean by contemporary thought? Um, I mean, uh, for example, uh, the issues uh, of AA files uh, are it's here. So uh, what constitutes the originality, for example, of today's, uh, of uh, this year's issue uh, in comparison uh, to the way of thinking of uh, the previous ones? I mean, issues are uh, not out of time. They are uh, published uh, in, uh, th they're really uh, strongly related um, with uh, time. So uh, in its uh, tempo, there is a, uh, there is a strong association with, uh, with its period. Um, so uh, originality, for example, uh, originality uh, in terms of time. I don't quite get it, but I mean, all I can say is that, you know, that I, I've, I've been trained as a historian, and, and so I always like to kind of, there's a certain period of time you know, a sort of uh, kind of floodplain into which we d I don't enter, you know. I think historians n writing about the contemporary are never so kind of convincing to me. You know, certain very interesting historians now, people like Antoine Picon or Tony Vidler, when they write about contemporary things, are never particularly engaging. I like historians writing about history. So there's a natural kind of prejudice in A files towards essays of architectural history. So I'm not kind of endlessly sort of looking around for the most current of all issues and then commissioning pieces about those. It's always, there's always a little bit of a chunk of time going backwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing has been more recent than the sort of 1980s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just as a kind of, that's just an, an, a kind of natural historian's precaution, you know? It's just a kind of safety net. But again, it's not a it's not an architectural journal of architectural practice, which is whatever happens to be the latest building. You know, the idea of the abs of the new is always built into those magazines. It's not a journal about architecture and about building. Uh, yeah, I, I was talking. I was mainly talking about the uh, the issues that you bring up nowadays, uh, which is uh, it's of course uh, a contemporary. Um, how can I say? Um, comment towards uh, historical uh, issues. So uh, I, I was not actually talking about a contemporary production necessarily, but contemporary thought over. But I just like the historian, you know, and I, and I like the idea of the historian being really quite central to an architectural diagram. Again, like the air used to be, you know, that the historian, the resident historian was always an important figure and a mm -hmm. figure that actually interacted with the designers. Mm -hmm. And now there's a kind of apartheid Mm -hmm. Designers design, historians teach history, and mm -hmm. it's as if these, these mm -hmm. two worlds with two different languages that should never collide. Mm -hmm. I think designers should, can get a lot out of history, just mm -hmm. as history can get a lot out of design. Yeah. And if you think of, uh, I mean, if you think of the history of 20th century architecture, it would be unthinkable without figures like Gideon and Bannum, who were both historians and related to design, right? Who played both back and forth between architects and designers, so it was a long history of that. History is always in some ways, the writing of history is always contemporary, right? Uh, but anyhow, we should pull this to a close, our first session. Um, thank you all for your questions and uh, thank you especially to Tom for uh, coming to present with us today. Great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're good.